the incomprehensible pleases us, the inexplicable is our friend. The cavern of unsolved crimes is littered with theories and suppositions, some based in reality, with others grasped from fragmented imaginations, though often in either case, the allure persists. As certain as time carries on, the depth and breadth of lore is seemingly inevitable. Every once in a while, an incident sticks with us that keeps us coming back, like opening the door to a fridge which we know is empty, yet hope maybe, somehow, contains something new to inspect. These incidents, which even after decades of intense scrutiny and thorough investigation, remain unsolved and are vast and varied. But this is my fridge. Welcome. a.m. December 1st, 1948, near Adelaide, South Australia. The body of a man is found on the bank of Somerton Park Beach. Well dressed, with legs crossed and head resting upon a sea wall, he could easily be mistaken for a businessman catching up on a missed sleep after having one too many the night before. But at 7 p.m. the previous evening, when he should have been ordering his second or third round, he was seen in this exact location and position, lifting his arm, dropping it weakly, limply, by a couple who were out for a stroll. By 7.30, the movement had ceased, as reported by another couple, who had observed him for a half hour and took him for a sleeping intoxicated man and nothing more. Later, another witness reported she had seen someone perched above, looking down at the sleeping man from the steps leading down to the beach. Eleven years later, more eyewitnesses came forward to share their account of seeing him slung over the shoulder of a well-dressed man trudging through the sand that same night. Extensive investigation, assessments, and an autopsy were performed with the following revealed. He was between 40 and 45 years old, in good shape, of average height, with gray eyes and aging ginger hair. His toes were pointed and calf muscles strong, suggesting he might have often worn boots or shoes with higher heels, or even performed as a ballet dancer. He wore brown slacks, a white shirt with a multicolored tie, brown pullover, and a notably sharp gray jacket, American made. All of the labels on his clothes had been removed. In his pockets, he had been carrying an unused train ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a box of Bryant and May matches, a U.S. made comb, a packet of juicy fruit gum, and a half-empty box of Army Club cigarettes, though inside were cigarettes of a different brand. On his person was no identification as no wallet could be found, leading investigators to consider suicide as the likely cause of death. His dental records were checked against the database, though no match was found. On autopsy, it was discovered the man had significant congestion throughout his internal organs, including his stomach, which contained the remnants of his last meal, along with blood. While no poisons or other substances were noted, the pathologist suggested a rapidly metabolized drug may have been the culprit in his passing. A month and a half later, a suitcase was located at the Adelaide Railway Station. It was noted to have been checked into storage after 11 a.m. the morning before he was seen on the beach. Inside were a number of typical items, including pajamas, slippers, underwear, and shaving supplies. However, it also contained some brown pants with sand in the cuffs, extensively brushed with ties to merchant ship officers, and a roll of orange waxed thread, the same which had been used to repair the lining and pockets of the pants he was ultimately discovered in. 
Additionally, the tie, the laundry bag, and undershirt all had variations of the name Keen on labels. One with a first name initial to T. When checked against records, it was determined no person in any English-speaking country at the time matched the name. In June of the following year, a formal inquest made by the original coroner a few days after the discovery of the body was resumed after an adjournment period. Many new findings emerged, most notably a small, rolled piece of paper sewn into the false pocket of his slacks. When unraveled, it laid out in beautiful script the words, Tamam Shud, a Persian phrase roughly translating to finished or ended. The cutting was traced to the back page of an English translation of poems by a Persian astronomer and poet named Omar Khayyam. The collection was entitled Rubaya. Following this discovery, the investigators led a nationwide search for the specific copy from which the paper had been removed. They ultimately found success when an unnamed man came forward with the copy in question, though its provenance remains unclear. It is widely believed that the book was found nearby, in an unlocked car either a few weeks prior to or just after the man's body was found. A closer inspection of the book revealed five lines of faint indentations, written in all capital letters and spelling out no real words. It was thought to be some type of code, however, cryptographers were unable to decipher it. There was, also, a telephone number. The number was associated with a nurse named Jessica Thompson, who lived a quarter mile from where the man was found. On interview, she denied knowing the man after being shown a bust cast from his body, though did say that sometime in 1948, a strange person had tried to contact her. He had also reportedly contacted Jessica's neighbor in order to gain access to her. She requested that her name not be associated with further investigations surrounding the case for fear of public humiliation and so was often referenced under pseudonyms, including Teresa Johnson, Nate Powell, and the nickname Justine. In further interviews, Jessica revealed that she had, in fact, owned a copy of the Rubaya, but had given it to an army lieutenant named Alf Boxall during World War II. After the war, she moved and married, and the two lost contact. Following these conversations, investigators concluded the body was very likely that of Alf Boxall. But that changed when he was located alive and with the very same copy he was gifted by Jessica in his possession. It was fully intact, including Tamam Shud at the back. And on the front page was a handwritten verse, number 70, which read, Indeed, indeed, repentance off before. I swore. Was I sober when I swore? And then, and then came spring and rose in hand. My thread bear penitence, the pieces tore. It was signed, Justine.